bless you. Bless your family. Let's bow down our heads as we pray. Father, as we go into your word, please uh, teach us your word. Let it be well with us. Let this word profit us. In Jesus' name we pray. Last Sunday we were talking about sustainable success. And we, today we move a little step forward to look into promises for sustainable success. We're going to make some references to what a little thing that we discussed last week and then we will, we will develop that. Promises for a sustainable success. We took our text from Joshua 1, from verse 3 to 7. Just those at home should please follow us carefully. Stop whatever you are doing that engages you into one thing or the other and let's concentrate. Joshua 1, 3 to 7. Every place that the sole of your feet shall tread upon that I have given you, not I would give you, I have given you. That's a promise. As I said unto Moses, and it's applicable to us also, the children of God at this time. And he talked about from wilderness and all that. When you go to verse 6, he said, though be strong and of good courage. Don't worry about those challenges. Don't worry about the business that is failing. Don't worry about things that does not look the way they ought to look. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou observe to do according to the law, according to what God has commanded. Which Moses or Pastor Adinijin, my servant, is trying to tell you. Turn not from me to the right or to the left, so that you may prosper whatsoever thou goest. Now, last week I said sustainability is the capacity or the ability to be able to maintain success at a certain rate. It's, it's relative. You want to maintain success, you think earning $30 per hour is the level of the success you want. That's why I said it's relative. It's the capacity or ability to be able to maintain success at a certain rate or level. And it's a continuous, viable, and feasible, and unceasing, and unstoppable success. And that's where what we are praying that every one of us we, we, we get to. And we said the opposite of sustainable success is the temporary or unenduring success. It's success that you cannot go home and sleep over. It's success that can overturn suddenly and what you have last year, you don't have them again. That's the opposite of sustainable success. And last week I said, the spiritual investment you put into your life and devil determines the success and the sustainability. The spiritual investment. We say, but pastor, we've been coming to church for, for years now. We have not seen anything. You're going to see it very soon. The spiritual investment you put into your life and they will determine the success and its sustainability. I think there was a young man, I think, the, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, I was telling the minister yesterday, there was a young man that come to this church. I think he came to pray in, the, in our prayer room. I think he has come before. He, when I asked them to come, they come. And he was giving us a testimony yesterday how his uh, investment, last year he made about three point. 3.5 to 4 million. Now, you know, I went to visit him with one of my, not in this state, but this is my son. If I call him tomorrow and say, yeah, you should come here now, he'll be here. He has, you know, the sustainability of your success depends on the spiritual investment you put into it. So let's look and say we are talking about promises for sus, uh, sus, sustainable success. Let's look at uh, three wonderful promises that God gave Joshua, which we also discussed last week. I'm just going to remind us again, then we now go to how promises affect uh, your successes. There was the promise of the promised land. Everybody has a promised land. Joshua 1, 3 to 4. The Israelites were to secure and occupy all the land and every place that they match. He said, I've given thee the land. The Israelites, where to you are supposed to take over a particular land, and you must ask yourself, which land am I taking? Are you there already, or you have not even started? There was a promise of a 
of a land. Number two, there was a promise of conquering the enemy. God knows that there will be contentions, there will be problems on the way or to your destiny. So he promised them, he said, I will be with you. In verse, uh, I think verse five, this is a picture of the believer's full victorious life. You have the assurance of a victorious life. Amen. Because there will be opposition, expect it. There will be enemies who will confront you. Expect it. Economic um, implication to your to your de to your destiny. Expect it. But the great promise of God is that victory and triumph are sure for the children of God. May I hear somebody say Amen to that? And three, there is the promise of the continued unbroken presence of God. And that's why this, uh, Job can say, even though he slay me, I will trust him because there was a call. God says he will go with them. Joshua 1.5 There was a promise of the continued unbroken presence and the rest of God with them. Now, why we not we look at these promises? We says promises for a sustainable success. Several issues can affect these divine promises of God. And I hope I'm able to deal with this today. There's a lot. A lot. When I was preparing this message overnight again, I look at, ah, I can't exploit it. But let me see how far I can go. Several issues can affect the divine promises of God and it will not make it to be sustainable. Either sustainable or non-sustainable. Number one, all requirement for the promise fulfilled. But promise is delayed by the promise of. Take note of that. You were given a promise. All requirement for that promise is fulfilled. But the promise is delayed by the promise of. First Samuel 16 and 12 to 14. First Samuel 16, 12 to 14. And he sent and brought David in. Now he was ruddy and without of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, Samuel, anoint David, for he is the king. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Now, here we see that God specifically sent Samuel to the house of Jesse. Go anoint someone as a king. And he was anointed as a king. It was nearly 15 years between the time that he was anointed king and the time he actually became a king. 15 years. Promise given. But promise delayed by the promise of to the promisee. He was enduring the process of the promise or delaying the promise because you may say, I've been coming to church, pastor prophesying to my life. I believe in his messages, but nothing is happening. Yes, it could be so because in the process of the delay by the promise, David was being tested, number one, just like Joseph was tested so that God could convert him from a shepherd boy to a king. So sometimes when the promiser is delaying the promise, it's a kind of test to prepare you for the manifestation of the promise. I pray in every area that you have been denied, God will take action on your behalf. Are you with me? It was then that he faced Goliath to be able to, to show the capacity to become a king. He was banished by Saul for several years to show him tenacity in the path of life. He healed in the desert to show that he can condition himself in any environment that he found himself. God prepared people, lived on the run, the devil, Using Saul to keep David on his feet, on the run from one valley to the other. You might be living on the run, tired of life. 
It's a process to an end as long as you remain. He said, don't deviate to the left or to the right. So you find out that in the case of David, he was first anointed as king. Privately without the knowledge of Saul. Saul remained king on the throne. But David was anointed. Why Saul was there without the knowledge of Saul? In 1 Samuel 16, 13 to 14. 1 Samuel 16, 13 to 14. Then he was anointed the second time, which was a partial anointing to get him close to the throne. He became the king of Judah. In 2 Samuel 2 and verse 4, 2 Samuel 2 and verse 4, he became the king of Judah. And all this happened within the space of first to 15 years of his first anointing. And the third anointing was the complete anointing in 2 Samuel 5 and 3 that saw David in charge. So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord and they anointed David king over Israel. So you see, the promiser gave the promise, go anoint him a king over my people and in the process, he has to go through another anointing over the years and another anointing over the years. So that called for your consistency in your work with God to be able to complete what you need to become what you want. But oftentimes you say, come to church and devil will, will lay you on the road. Maybe that's the second anointing you needed that day. And the pastor will say, yeah, all of you that is here today, I'm going to anoint you. So you missed it. So there was a consistency. David never go back home to say, oh, no, this trouble is too much for me. They asked me to come to church last week. They asked me to come again today. I think I will have to skip two or three. I'm tired. So promise given by the promiser, by the, promi by the promiser, and, but delayed. Delayed is not a denier. The only one who can deny a promise from God is you. If you don't apply his principle. Am I talking to somebody in the house? Uh -huh. So by now you're supposed to be asking yourself, where I am now in faith? Is it God or me? Last Wednesday, suddenly God asked us to pray for three hours. That was the first time in a very, very long time that we came to church and closed at nine and we were instructed by the Holy Spirit to avert Sunday incident that is not going to be good for our members. And people waited for three hours to pray. But your head was not in that prayer. The head of your children were not in that prayer. And we are in the same church, confronting the same environmental problems, confronting the same contention in the spirit realm. But while others are praying, you were sleeping at home. Anyone that will walk with the Lord will serve him, should serve him in spirit and in truth. The moment your service is selective, based on your comfort, you have not started working with God. And we say this all the time on this altar. I pray that may the promises of God for you, may you never allow God to delay that promise again. Even to say amen is difficult for you. Because you are the one disallowing God to make you what he wants to become because you are not consistent. So the first thing is that promise given by the promiser but delayed. All requirement met. But the promiser delay the promise uh, to the promisee for a reason. Point number two. All requirement for the promise fulfilled, but the promiser found a fault in the life of the promisee and denied him. We are talking about sustainable success. All requirement for the promise fulfilled, but the promiser found a fault in the life of the promisee and now decided to say, okay, since you have done this, no more promise for you. 1 Samuel 2, 30 to 31, King James Version. Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel said, 
I said indeed that your house, the house of thy father, should walk before me forever. Come to the church on, on Wednesday. Come to Bible studies. Come to Sunday school. Come to prayer meetings. That is what I said. But now the Lord said, be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house, that there shall not be any old man in this house. I did say that you will remain as a king, as a priest, but I've changed my mind. I've changed it because you change it. You change the agreement. You shift the goalpost. And I'm not going to do what I promised you. Brethren, we run the rat race. I've said it last week. I said there are two types of life. There is a life of sustenance, which survivor of the fittest just run as others are running. Hey, I want to become this. Hey, I got a job three hours per hour. I live that one. I go for ten hours per hour. I didn't sleep last like night. I came from work to to church. That's why pastor don't understand. It is rat race that have came to run in this life. There are some people who say, no, I want to live a life of substance. God, what would you have me do for you? Every prayer meeting, the idea, God, I want to listen to you clearly. What do you have me do for you? My protocol that followed me to travel yesterday, we went for about five hours drive from here to meet my son, whom God told what he needs to do. And three years ago, his uh, turnover was about two point something million Last year was 3.5 million to 4 million, to 5 million, uh, to 4 million last, last year. Because he decided to seek the face of God to live a life of substance. A life of substance, as I keep repeating to you, will require self discipline, will require self sacrifice, will require time management. You spend your time on things that, what, that will determine your better future. You don't keep spending your time on, 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 on Facebook, on WhatsApp, on parties. My wife had a, at, at 61 bad day yesterday, and I wasn't home. Because party is not our priority in this ministry. I wasn't home. So your wife, bad day, why not stay at home? There's something, there is a ministry work that I need to do. And so I called her, where are you? She said, I want to find myself. She was complaining about the choir yesterday. That my wife said, when she was waiting here, telling God, look, I don't want to live the remaining of my life in pain. She said, there was so much noise in the church. She didn't enjoy her prayer. But you, your bad day, you call all your friends. Who does not determine your future? You took them out. It's good. We will be going. I'm taking my wife out. But there must be, anybody who wants to live a life of substance must be able to have a very good time management. Know when to be in the presence of God to come and say, God, thank you, Jesus, which she did yesterday. Today, I want to take her out. And I told her, if you want to go to Kakum, I have a friend who can sponsor a private jet to Kakum. But she won't. She will prefer um, all you can eat. <laughs> Mongolia, or just let's make it light. I don't want to trouble you so that you'll be thinking that I'm very too expensive to manage. How do you plan your life that pleases God? You want to do bad day, you will call the whole of the world to a party. You will please them. And on Sunday, you come and drop $20 and say, God, I have pleased people from London, from Africa. They came for my birthday. They are the one that kept me alive. They are the one who made me what I am in life. When you are spending about 30, 40,000, they will not come on Sunday and come and do dance given and clothes given. They will put chain here, bongo here. They will dance and do all the dancing. And when they have left, and I check the boat, $100 with people who flew in from Africa, from London. How do you want that God to give you more blessing? He said, I've promised before. I'm not saying people should not do patio. 
In fact, like I said, I'm taking my wife out because you may hear later that after the service, where is pastor? And they will tell you, ah, pastor is the one of the best restaurants in town. Yes, because I've done what I need to do. All work and no play. requirement for promise fulfilled but the promise of found a fault I pray for you that the God who has ordained your life to be something will not find a fault in you you don't know the prayer it's better than to say that your enemy should die because if your enemy should die maybe you will not be alive today because I know your enemy you don't have any Many of you, your enemy is you. Because you won't listen to God. You won't give God priorities. It is your job, money, money, that is running your life. And I fear ye, worldliness. That is your first priority. He said, this promise I gave you, but because you deviated, you didn't do what I expect you to do. I will deny you. That's the second point. Let's go to the third point because uh, I, I need to, I, I don't want to repeat this issue of the promise next time, next week. Number three, all requirements for the promise fulfilled and promises seize the promise but do not enjoy the promise. All requirements fulfilled to give you the promise. Then the promisee see the promise. But you just see it, he did not enjoy it. I'll give two instances quickly in the Bible. The first instance is Rachel. Rachel, the wife of Jacob. Genesis 35, 17, 18. And after a very hard delivery, the midwife finally exclaimed, Don't be afraid, New Living Translation. You have another son. Rachel was about to die. But when her last breath, she named the baby. Benoni, which means son of sorrow. She delivered, she conceived. She wanted a child, she conceived. Delivered the baby. As she was delivering the baby, she died. May you not die before you enjoy your promise. Only two people said amen to that. But the question is why the Rachel success of delivery was not sustainable. She delivered. But it was not sustainable. Three common errors in family that affected Rachel. Number one, this is because of careless lies that she told her father and her husband. White lies. Your husband just asked you, the money you sent to Nigeria, what did you send it to do? I didn't send the money. Oh. And in that same house, you have prayed that no liar will succeed in life. Somebody have told lie against you. You have caused that person. That because you told lie, you will not do this. You will not, they will not lie. And God is taking, he said, you, you told lies to your husband. Because your husband, husband is entitled for a lie. And you told your wife a lie. Three common mistakes that Rachel did. That he told lie, he, a careless lie to her father and her husband. Is somebody following this teaching? Number two, assumption. There's also the fact that she undermined her husband. Pronouncement of debt for anyone that, that, that tells lie. Jacob, I will read the passage. Jacob said, uh, the, um, Rachel's father was looking for something that was missing. And Rachel stole that thing. Is it my Bakinzu who said, Government money in government house is the same thing. In government money in governor's house is the same money. Whether it's in the government coffer, it's still government money. If I carry everything in the government coffer, I bring it to my house and begin to spend it, it's still government money for the governor. So Rachel stole his father's property and brought it along with her. And the father was looking for that property. He said, Babylonia is my father's property. It's not with me, oh. Careless, 
assumption. And when uh, just, uh, Jacob was saying that, whoever tells lies, we die. Oh. Many of you women, when you are told and your husband is pronouncing the curse, you don't believe it. The husband too, when they carry woman, and the wife will say, hey, anybody that betray each other will not end well in this house. And the husband will say again, you, even pastor, of course, it didn't work. You will know the pastor. <laughs> Stupid undermining statements that we tell each other in the house. Stupidly undermining statements of a cause that we tell each other in the house could have a, an unredeemable, unredeemable consequences. And number three, that's also because she concealed an information from her husband. You are doing something that your husband is supposed to know. You are concealing it. If he knows, I won't allow, he, won't, she won't, he won't allow me to do it. You are in a relationship that's supposed to be open. And you are concealing information. You can't reach your goal. You have betrayed the essence of that relationship. I tell people, even if your partner is unfaithful, let God deal with that unfaithfulness. Don't partner with an unfaithful person to send you to hell. That's what Ananias and Sapphira did. If your husband wants to go to hell, you didn't know in heaven before you came here. You met at motor park. At the day of heaven, everybody will go to where they choose to go. At the day of judgment. Everybody, you didn't meet. Uh, did you meet in heaven that you, both of you are coming to be? It's just tenant. You are just living together here as tenant. So if your husband is crazy, why would you allow a crazy man to send you to, heaven, to hell? Manage the crazy man. Play your own part until the day of judgment. And if it is the wife that is the super crazy, as long as you are in the deal, Allow the super craziness to go to where she wanted to go. So Rachel saw the promise, but did not enjoy it. Genesis 31, 32 to 36. Genesis 31, 32 to 36. But as for your gods, message translation, but as far as your gods are concerned, if you find that anybody here has them, that person dies. That's what Jacob said to his father-in-law. You are pursuing me because you think somebody stole your property. If anybody is having your property, because I trust my wives and my children, that they won't take anybody's property. If they take it, they die. And Rachel was having it. He did not tell the husband immediately that, wow, reverse this, you know, the thing is with me. She undermined her husband's authority. And I pity you, woman, who doesn't respect your husband. You think you are equal. You are equal, though, but uh, the head, if you take the head away, the whole body becomes empty. He now said, with all of my watching, look around. If you find anything here that belongs to you, take it. So Laban went through Jacob's tent, Leah's tent, and the tent of two men, but didn't find them. Then he went to Leah's tent, from Leah's tent, he went to Rachel. But Rachel had taken the household god, put them inside the camel cushion, and was sitting on them. So when Laban has gone through the tent, searching high and low without finding the thing, Rachel said to her father, Don't think I'm being disrespectful that I did not get up to greet you, my father, that I can't stand before you, but I'm having my period. So because of my period, Baba Joe, don't be offended eh, that he was hiding something here. Sending something by Western Union without your spouse. Hiding something here. Sitting down on, on Wahala. Sending it by Western Union. Don't call my uh, partner that I sent him to. Don't thank him all. Because I didn't tell him that I would send something. You are sitting on Wahala. Why are you in a relationship that you don't want to be honest? And you say it's for better for worse. Dishonest spouses.
He saw the promise. He didn't enjoy it. I pray God will cause you to repent. All of you that are laughing, that you know what you are doing to your partners. When the man is coming, you hide all the documents. Or when the, the, the wife is coming, she quickly hide the document. What did we bring into this world? You, are bringing, you brought nothing, you will go with nothing. The rich man die, the poor man die. They don't know what happens to the riches they give. Why are you living a dishonesty of life? Another person that saw the promise that did not reach, I want to give two examples. It's Moses. In Exodus 3, 16 to 17, God told Moses, go, gather all the elders of Israel together and say unto them, the Lord God of your father, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appear unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I, I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction and take you to a land that flows with milk and honey. Moses, God, the promise, God said, I will take you there. But Moses saw the promise far off, but did not enjoy it. In Deuteronomy 3, verse 20, 24 to 27, Moses said, God, my master, message translation, you let me in, in on this beginning, you let me see your greatness. You let me see your might, what God in heaven on earth can do anything like what you have done. Please let me also... On the end, let me cross and see that promised land that you, you said I would take your people across the Jordan. But God was still angry with me because of you. He wouldn't listen to me. He said, enough of that. Not another word from you, Moses. Climb to the, to the top of Mount Pisgah and look around. Look at the west, north, south of the promise that I told you 40 years ago. You are seeing it with your eyes. You, you will not eat out of it. That is the kind of life many of us are living now. You see the good of the land. You hear about somebody who has an investment of three point something million within a year. You are hearing this. But what is the fault of Moses? He got angry. He got angry. And Moses used to talk to God one on one. Somebody who used to talk to God one on one got angry with God. A friend of God. Got angry. God gave me an instruction. Come to church at 9 o'clock. He came. He got angry and said, Ah, pastor, don't know that the weather is bad. And he got angry at the pastor. He got angry at God and struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock. And God said, See, come. Come. To a low He said, You don't listen. Come and see what you labor for for 40 years. See it with your eyes. You will not enjoy it. Can you stretch your two hands to the Almighty God? Say, Lord, don't let me labor in vain. Please, help me. If Before I make any mistake that will make me to labor in vain, please be merciful unto me. Are you praying? You are not praying the prayer because you, you seem not to count it very important. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Um, which number am I going? Number four. The promise depart from the condition upon which the promise was made. That's another way to put the number four. The promise depart from the condition upon which the promise was made. First Samuel 2, 30 to 32. Therefore, this is God's word, the God of Israel speaking. I once said that you and your ancestral family will be my priests indefinitely. But now, God's word, remember, there's no way this can continue. The promise depart from the condition upon which the promise was made. Let's go down a little bit. Number five, the promise got the promise on the platform of affliction and problems. And that's where many of us, we, we run away from challenges of the ministry. We run away from the truth of our profession. We run away, we run away. From the condition and requirement and obligations of our profession. A witch will be ready to fly in the night. When they enter into witches, they give you condition. We are meeting tonight and you don't go. You know the trouble you are facing. They meet the obligation of what they sign up for. 
When you sign up to become a child of God, a believer, you should be committed to what you signed up for. Win more souls. Be committed to the service, to the church, to every doctrine of the Bible. The promise, the promise, see God, the promise on the platform of affliction and problems. Hebrews 6, 12 to 15, Hebrews 6, 12 to 15, that ye be not slothful. The New Living Translation says, do not become spiritual dull and indifferent. Many of us are so indifferent, you are at home listening to me, you are, joy, you are enjoying listening to me when God wants you to come to his house to fellowship. And you are saying, well, God understand. Say, that ye be not slothful. Do not become spiritual dull and indifferent. And the message translation says, do not drag your feet, but stay with committed faith. Message translation says, stay with committed faith. And be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Be followers of those who through faith, who through patience, inherit the promise. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could not swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, surely in blessing, I will bless thee. And multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so after he had, Abraham had patiently endured. He received the blessing. When you combine patience with endurance, it means whether it is rain or fire, you are ready to go with Jesus. When he calls me, I will follow. When he calls me, I will follow. When he calls me, I will follow. I go with him. I go with him. All the way. In the rain, I go with him. In the snow, I go with him. When I'm tired, I go with him. I go with him. With him. All the way. When Abraham has patiently endured, the promise came. Abraham's blessings were through delay, were though delayed, but it was preserved. When you go with him in your challenges, your promises are preserved. They are not taken away. They are preserved and they become sustainable for you to acquire. For seven years, we were looking for, this, for the fruit of the womb. I know how many times that I sleep at home. When others, when I, I walk in the oil field, oil field is so brain straining. I was a safety superintendent in the oil field. Sometimes I'm offshore on the field, terrible job sometimes. Fly on the helicopter, do everything. When I'm home for my off, I'm supposed to be relaxing. But I find myself in the mountain top, pray God, do not forget me. God, please, I need to have a child. I will sleep on the mountain today sleep here tomorrow and we did that consistently until the promise came and none affect each other if they say workers meeting is six i'm there before any other person if they say we are doing go fishing i'm the one there before any other person and i was done doing it because i was looking for child i was doing it because i was called when i became a christian to do the right thing Because you refuse to do the right thing, the promise will not be preserved for you to take. You will lose it before maturity. 
Psalm 138 and verse 7 to 8. Psalm 138, 7 to 8. Say, though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou will revive me. Though thou shalt stretch forth thy hand against the wrath of the enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endure forever. Forsake not the words of thy hands. The message translation says, in Psalm 138, 7 to 8, say, when I walk into the thick of trouble, keep me alive in, in the angry tumor, because he will never forsake. He said, with one hand, strike my enemies. With the other hand, save me. Here, there are two hands here. You choose to parley with the devil. So when he's using the right hand to save you, you are using the left hand to say, I want to go with the devil. I want to go with my job. I am tired. I can't come to church early. Pastor, don't understand. This is America. We have to run the rat race. He said, with one hand, I will strike your devil, the, your problems. With another hand, I will save you. The one is trying to save you, he give you condition for the salvation. You say, no, I want to be where the enemies can hit me. Now, so finish what you started in me, God. Your love is eternal. I pray for someone under the sound of my voice. God will finish what he started with you. Whatever will make you lose that thing, God will take it away from you. Let me end. I have so many. <laughs> Let me end because of our time. I can see one or two people looking at their time. So let's, let's deal with it. The promisee do not have the capacity to hand the promise. The promisee do not have what? The capacity to hand the promise. It's like you don't have the womb. God wants to give you a child. But when a child you come, the womb is not there. You have not conditioned yourself to be what God wants you to become. You refuse to condition yourself. You, God is programmed that you will marry a president of a nation, a president of a corporation. The God wants to cook you, prepare you, do something when you are still a single. And he said, no, no. They don't do stuff like that. I can't be there. I, can't, I don't like it. And God said, no. I want to train you. I'm preparing you. I want this womb to be prepared. I want to, this womb to be fertilized so that you can bring, you can give back to a president of a nation. He said, no, I don't want that kind of a womb. When the promisee does not have the capacity of the promise that is given, that's the last one I will talk about, and then we will pray one or two prayer points. It could be spiritually. You don't have the capacity spiritually to carry on with what God wants to give you. Colossians 1, 9 to 11. New Living Translation. It says, Paul says, so we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will. If you don't have complete knowledge of his will, you don't have the capacity to fulfill that will. You can't get the will of God on the job that you are doing. Your job can be translated to be his will that you must find out in the place of relationship. <laughs> oh. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. If you don't have the capacity of the spiritual wisdom needed for your destiny, you can't get there. You don't have the spiritual wisdom needed and your understanding that will take you to the place of your destiny you can't get there. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. The moment you have the knowledge of his will, wisdom and understanding, the way you manage your life, time management, priority will not begin to please him. And your life will produce every kind of good fruit. Then you will have sustainable success. 
We also pray that you'll be strengthened with all his glorious power. It is when you continue to walk in his will, in his knowledge, in his understanding, then he strengthens you with his glorious power and you will have all the endurance and patience that you need. God knows that you need endurance and patience to walk with him. Hebrew 4, 1 to 2. I'm talking about spiritual capacity. Somebody said spiritual capacity. Hebrew 4, 1 to 2 says, Let us therefore fear, King James Fashion, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, of having sustainable success. Any of you should seem to come short of it. The reason why you are where you are is that you, are, you have come short of what he wants you to be. He says, for unto us was the gospel preached, as well unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that had it. The, there are two categories of people in the church. One, the word preached was mixed with faith. I'm ready to go all out and serve this God. For the other, it did not mix with faith. Immediately they hear the word. Before they leave here, the enemy will come steal the word from them. Say, so come on when I say for another prayer, they say, no. I got to listen to my WhatsApp. I got to check my Facebook. I have a meeting of Obama Shop Parapo or South South. Ogoma Shaw South, South. We have two Ogoma Shaws. We have North and we have South. You have allowed non relevant things to destroy your future destiny and the destiny that you're supposed to have for your children because you cannot walk with God. You didn't allow the messages you hear to mix with your faith. I hope I've not offended anybody to, this morning because the way you are looking at me because uh, I need a binocular to see if you're actually happy with me this morning. So you, some do not have the spiritual capacity and to round up, others do not have the intellectual capacity. Now hear this. Ask the one next to you, say, can your profile Tell the person next to you, say, can your profile take you beyond where you are in your choosing path to your destiny? Can you help me put that on the altar quickly? Can your profile take you beyond where you are in your choosing path to your destiny? Can your profile take you to beyond where you are in your choosing path to your destiny. Can your profile take you beyond where you are in your choosing path to your destiny? You are doing a building business. And they said they are doing um, a conference in downtown of those who are acquiring properties, how to acquire properties, and you need to pay a thousand dollars for the conference. Say me, a thousand dollar that will give me seven hundred thousand naira. <laughs> when I convert that to naira, hey <laughs> Jesus Christ of Nazareth. <laughs> I have a boss who normally go for a marriage counseling course. And seminar in Atlanta those days is 5,000 5,000 costs to go for a marriage counseling course you say your marriage is not right your wife one screw has turned off my husband there is a course in their house that they say there is a marriage counseling course because you have to spend $300 and buy a flight of uh, $200 and stay in an hotel of another 300 and you spend 1000 you will not go. But your friend is doing 
party in uh, Tatankone. Or what's the name of that place? That island. No, not Cancun. Galantoni, a big. There are so, so many islands. Let's take Tatankoni. Or, or somebody is speaking Hawaii. And then you will buy the Ashwebi. You will buy the tickets. Tatankana. Huh? Putankana. Putankana. Or, or my wife said we will go to. Where do you say we should go? That nearly caused problem in the house. <laughs> Mexico. What is in Mexico? Cancun. So I said I want to go in October last year. You and your protocol. You planned it for August. You didn't consider me and your wife. And husband needs to sit down with their wife before they conclude with their protocols. And from domestic, for domestic harmony, I say, you got it. Just give me your date this year because I have changed. <laughs> Imagine the money you spent on irrelevant clothes, irrelevant chain. You know, the, the chain I'm wearing now, I bought it 3000 That does not add value to your destiny. You will buy the one they put on the leg. You buy the one they put on the leg. Then you buy the one they put on the neck. Double captivity, leg and neck. <laughs> then you, you put the one for the hands. And you have not added any value, intellectual value, to what will make your destiny relevant. I was talking to one of my daughters recently. I've not seen her for a while. I just went to their house. Very wonderful daughter, beautiful daughter. And she began to educate me. I said, you have so much daughter in your head. Where is Emanuela? Emanuela Duke. Somebody should brought Emanuela. What have you added to your intellectual capacity that can define your destiny? A guy came to my office this morning. He said, Daddy, I want to see you. Ah, this girl, most of the people that want to see me, they are either 24 or 25. They want to talk about, I want to pray for husband. And this, this is a girl of uh, maybe 12 years old. See me on Sunday morning. You know, I'm preparing for my... He said, yeah, Daddy, just give me one minute. Yes, I said, okay, come, come, let's see, daughter. He said, you see... I look into the church, you see, and I saw that the head cover, some of them are torn, and some of them look dirty. What plan do we have about washing them and all that? <laughs> but you, when you come, you gaggle in, you gaggle out. Things of God does not interest you, and you want to benefit from that God. He said, that's number one. And I said, mommy has a program of when we wash it. So I call a dad. So this is your department. They said, yes, they have when they normally wash it. He said, number two, I was reading your recent book on identity. And I discovered some grammatical errors. So, um, can I speak to your editor so that we can put this together? Emanuela! <laughs> can you can your profile, the profile you have 
Can that prophet take you beyond where you are in your chosen career? Can that prophet? Emanuela, come. The church were asking, who is this, Emanuela? Emanuela at her age has a burden of how this church can look better. Emanuela at her age has a burden of how pastor's book can be grammatically corrected. And you are coming to the same church, you gaggo in, gaggo out. You think God does not take notes? I gave you that book. Some of you, I gave it to you. Maybe you take it for him. You throw it away. What value do you add to where you are that can prepare you for the future? Manola, God bless you. I love you. You are one of the best that I've ever met in life. You look good, man. God bless you. Exodus 31, 1 to 4. God spoke to Moses. See what I have done. Message translation. I have personally chosen Bezali, son of Uri, son of Or, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the spirit, the spirit of God, giving him skill and know-how and expertise in every kind of craft to create design. Even God putting intellectual, intellectual investment on Bezali, preparing Bezali for his future. And the Brahminko said, I will prepare myself, perhaps my opportunity will come. How much have you prepared yourself? Are you preparing yourself on mundane things, things that does not profit? When I said this, some people post something on the internet. I said, is God happy with what you are posting? How many times have you posted, Jesus loves you, converts, be a child of God, you are investing in the kingdom and God will say, that's my man. And what you post is your new car, your new dress. And God will say, this is a, this is a useless member. Bow down your heads. And I want you to talk to God. Talk to God quickly. That I don't want to lose your promises for me. Standing on the promises of God, my King. Through eternal ages that this place is real.